it's up is it up yeah okay so welcome everyone my name is uh, Christophe Gancia Kuvuts president of the language creation society and I'm really happy to welcome you all of you to the language creation conference um, <laughs> And uh, for the people who are not uh, present uh, bodily here, you can still uh, participate with the, uh, via IRC, our LCS uh, channel. And if you don't have an IRC client, we also have a, a chat page. Just log in and uh, uh, participate as well. So uh, I'll just be very quick um, about uh, this. This is. It's quite a special language creation conference, the second one in Europe, first one in England. Thanks to the uh, uh, good work and efforts of our local hosts, uh, Alex uh, Fink, Likara Ryder, who's. Uh, yeah. Likara Ryder. And, uh, Pete Bleakley. Hello, yeah, Pete Bleakley, who I would like to. Uh, Let's say so a few words about uh, about the venue, about what's going to happen today here. Well, thank you all for coming. I was uh, so desperate to meet other conlangers that I um, volunteered to organise a conference. <laughs> um, so, uh, the just a couple of words about the. Capital Theatre, which is our local arts centre here in Horsham. Uh, the Wi-Fi password. Password is up there. It's capital one, and uh, the for the facilities, ladies and disabled are just across the um, lobby there, where you had uh, refreshments. Gents are downstairs and across the main lobby from the stairs. Um, one other thing I'd like to draw your attention to, which is if anybody has brought any objects or artifacts related to conlanging, please put them on the table of the artefacts over here. You can see a, a little piece of wood there, and that is in, has an inscription on it, which I made this morning in Buchstaff Runes in Hengathiagon. So, um, is there anything else that uh, you need to know before we start? What was that? I'll um, just quickly to say that if you've all noticed that one of uh, tomorrow uh, to be announced uh, uh, slot. This is a very special talk which was <laughs> took a long time in the making, but uh, the uh, LCS has has worked with uh, uh, lawyers to look into the legal status of conlangs, and tomorrow. Uh, the to be announced uh, slot is about a presentation that Sai is going to do about that. So, um, before I carry on, another special announcement is that this uh, uh, conference is filmed especially by uh, uh, Britain, Britain Watkins, who is uh, currently working on a documentary about conlanging and about us. A few things to say about it, giving the, the word. And <coughs> David Peterson, whom some of you know, I think all of you know, at least by reputation, handshake, is up here too because um, he is working also on this film. And we have a little intro for you uh, that was only finished at about midnight last night UK time with a, a, a last minute edition. But um, I will press some button that will make it play. Tehran بودم یک کم فارسی یاد گرفتم در تزما درباره فارسی یاد گرفتم و تزما درباره زبان فارسی نوشتم
So I would say if you're stop. not gonna write, hand it over to somebody. Don't keep going. Stop. And hand it over to somebody. Don't keep going. What inspires the thing that you're writing with and the thing that you're writing on? Consider the thing that you're writing with and the thing that you're writing on. That strongly determines the character of your writing system. And that's why we led alphabet workshops. We led alphabet workshops before, where people who had never held a pencil before were learning how to write their own language for the first time. In the middle of the day, the patch on board, 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 the patch on what I wanted to make sure that we, that we didn't lose is we didn't lose uh, the stories of the of the people who were just creating languages just for the pure joy of it. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think it's important to strike a balance. You mm -hmm. know, I definitely want our film to be about conlanging, and that means the art of doing it, the people who do it. I don't even remember when I started conlanging. Um, I remember I was so young that I had to look up what it was to remind myself. I think my first couple of conlangs are probably best forgotten. I remember putting in a lot of Zs and apostrophes because that's what you do when you're that young. It's it's the matrix verb that does the assigning, right? Well, phrasal heads, if you're a do you do it with relative clauses too? There's one less argument position available. So it's a different index in the relative clause though. The suffixes could also be a personal pronominal. Yes, that's how it works. I don't know, languages are fascinating and to create one is just really, it's just really cool. I hope you're all excited about our documentary film, Conlanging, which I think is going to do a lot to bring the idea and the excitement of Conlanging to the general public. And a big thanks to all of you who have agreed to be interviewed and to participate in the documentary. I'm really looking forward to learning a lot about your creations. Hi everyone, my name is Christine Schreier and I'm sorry I can't be at LCC6 with you, I really wish I could. It's just a little bit too far from the west coast of Canada. But I hope to be there in the next one, two years from now. And thank you all for participating in our conlanging film. Hi, this is Mark Okrand. I want to say hello to LCC6 and thank everyone who's willing to participate in this upcoming film about conlanging. I think it'll be really terrific. I think you'll have a good time doing it and I think you'll be really pleased with the results. I'm Willie Manis and I'm going to be the editor for the companion book for this project. The book will let us include detail that is really practical in a film. So I would like to thank everyone who's going to help us by sharing their work with us. That's just a random smattering of some of the footage that we've collect collected so far. You will see this gentleman gets around a lot to conferences and things, so you'll see his face in it a lot. David Sallow, who's also a producer on the film, sends his greetings. He didn't get in a video this time, but um, he also thanks everybody for supporting the project. And um, we didn't go in because here we are to thank you and putting up with us and we want to ask you a couple of things to tell you a little bit about the film and ask you a couple of things today so we want you to understand that this is going to be a feature-length film uh, documentary we're making fingers are making it about con langers so we hope it'll have a true authentic voice and that everybody will get represented in the best way possible uh, it's made for a general audience. Again, we're not going to speak conlangese to each other for an hour and a half. We can do that at conferences like this or on Skype or whatever. So this is going to be for people, a general audience, anybody who would be interested in a documentary about art or social justice or any other topical issue in, in society should be interested in this film. Uh, we hope that's the way we're planning to make it. And 
we need a lot of community support. Um, we like your moral support. If you think it's a policy, you think it's a good idea. Eventually, there'll be a crowdfunding project as well, and we will certainly let you know about that. And if you're willing to support us financially, that'll be great too. We're also applying for grants, so it's possible that the project might actually be officially funded substantially by, uh, for example, a portion of the Canadian know yet question marks around all that but we're trying to do it in the best professional way possible and today one thing that we do want to make sure is that um, everyone here in the room is comfortable with the fact that you understand the fact that we're shooting with a couple of different cameras and if anybody does not want to be in the film if you do not want to be recorded you don't want to be on camera you don't give us your permission to be included um, at all please talk to me or talk to David or talk to Alan, who's at the back of the room with his big camera. He's right in the middle at the back. If you can't see him right now, I promise you he's there. Um, and again, let us know and we will try to avoid shooting you because we don't want anybody to be uncomfortable. Um, however, if you are comfortable being in the film, it would help now if everybody would just raise your hand and let us see that you're okay with that. Okay. Is that pretty much everybody? If you're not raising your hand, that's totally fine. We don't want to pressure you. I just wanted to get a general feeling for how everybody was. And again, if you do not want to be recorded or you don't want to be included for let Alan in the back or David or me know, and we'll take care of that. Um, also, I want to mention quickly the companion book. So you saw at the end of the video clip, William Annis, who is a, a long-standing member and I think he's on the board now, isn't he? Yeah, the LCS. So um, William is going to be in charge of the companion book. We are going to collect 100, 150, 130, we don't know exactly how many hours of footage yet for this project. That needs to go down into a film that's an hour and a half long. So there's going to be a lot of editing. There's going to be a lot of precious things that we don't want to lose. And a lot of details about your languages or your approach to conlanging that would be very difficult to capture on film, where a book that could tolerate some prose or additional imagery or different approaches to graphs and tables and whatnot might be a better way to do it. So we plan to do a companion book as well um, that will exist as an EPUB. And if we can get the right kind of funding and the right kind of support, we hope to do it as a printed volume as well. Um, how that will be published and how it will be available to people yet, we're not exactly sure, but we're at the most beginning stages of the, this film. Even though it looks like maybe the film is kind of done, it's not done yet. <laughs> we have a long way to go. So thank you for everybody who's been interviewed here already. Several people participated yesterday in interviews. Um, we're going to try to fit people in tomorrow morning. And it might be tonight, and it might be tomorrow night after the conference is over. So we'll do the best that we can with the time that we have available. Thank you very much. And if there's any time for questions, we'll do them now. If there's no time for questions, see me or David for questions over the course of the next two days. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, without further ado, uh, just one last announcement. The um, lunch will be at around uh, one o'clock and will be at the same place as you had the drinks and cookies. So everybody, everything should be ready by one o'clock. Um, so, now let's, without further ado, let's start with the meat of the conference. And um, the first presentation um, just quickly, uh, we are all conlangers, we all love languages, we all like to create our languages, but how many of us actually speak our own languages, our own conlangs fluently? Not many, eh? I know I don't. But some people live, live their, uh, uh, their languages, and this is one of them. And so, I'm uh, announcing now the very first presentation of the 6th Language Creation Conference, Organic Conlanging Through Stability and Immersion, with Jim Hopkins, who will present in his native Itlaini, 
and Tony Harris as his interpreter. Is this? Ah, yes, it is now. Okay. So I, Jim is actually going to do the, the talk, but let me just start with a, a brief thing. Um, I wanted to give you all sort of fair warning that um, Jim's talk is actually going to be done in Itlani, and I'm going to be translating what he says. Um, and uh, as part of this process, I sort of learned that as much Itlani as I thought I knew, I as much as I thought I did, so I have been cramming for three months <laughs> to prepare. Um, the Itlani is a uh, is a, an SOV language, subject, object, verb, so that sometimes makes the translation a little awkward, and it may come out sounding a little bit like Yoda occasionally. Um, I apologize in advance, and I assure you that the original actually sounds a good deal better than my translation will. So, with that. Can you hear me? <laughs> Entirely too well. Okay, um Star Starviate um, oh, sorry, I said I would translate. I didn't actually say I would translate into English, did I? <laughs> <laughs> so, l let me do that again. Um, <laughs> greetings, everyone. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here at my first language creation conference. Thank you all for coming. This presentation is uh, loosely based on four of my suggestions for conlanging. I believe you all have a copy. In, yes, part, part in English and part in Idlani. Today, my uh, good and longtime friend Tal Dafar, that's me, um, will translate. Conlanging is a passion for all of us. In various ways, we all love our conlangs. But in However, however, our relationship to our um, conlang discoveries or um, uh, varies oh, in our initial design goal. Uh, during the process of giving things like we unavoidably arrive at different goals. Because the goals differ uh, by, um, in the same way the results will differ. <laughs> free and non-judgmental acceptance of each other's work uh, must be our our way, our modus operandi. Uh, some conlangs, therefore, 
Design and uh, yeah, now now it's going to be tough. Design um, are scientific. Some in concept and execution uh, will be artistic. Will be between the two. All of them are praiseworthy projects. All of them remain respectable in their respective design areas. Conlangs, most often, or more often than the always. Uh, the concept of fluency itself has differing degrees and um, parameters. For example, free and um, deeper usage um, ease of self-expression has been my goal. A method creating a literary all that might be. Some beer, some beer. <laughs> Um, they, they are also a means of developing uh, a form of self-expression. Uh, the supreme goal is communication. Whether by pen or not research. I I apologize that the um, that I don't I don't want to. What was that? Oh. Um, to use, to use the notes. Oh, I apologize for having to use the notes. <laughs> Therefore, fluency becomes most important. So that the language can be successfully used in writing and speaking. Uh, the policy of authenticity um, or policies of authenticity, stability, and of sound and meaning, are the first steps towards fluency. In the first place, um, okay, um, the authentic con or authenticity provides for the language uh, more reliable and uh, deeper um, content or and unified content. The content of the language is faithful to its nature. Its fabric is tightly woven. 
Um, like a well-ordered system, it is more easily understandable and therefore more learnable. In the words of the Itlani, it has brudat, or weight, or gravitas. Whenever a new uh, grammatical um, construct, expression or word, presents itself, allow yourself to feel whether or not it is authentic. Uh, does the, uh, the word or addition, the new addition, harmonize with the internal truth of the people who speak the language? Uh, does the new addition uh, into the language or the culture um, and into the environment of the speakers of the language uh, seem to fit? Secondly, um, the authenticity or the stability or the uh, canon, no, the foundational canonicity um, ensures that um, a um, a solid grammatical system will accumulate into the language and changes or comes uh, hold it keep it in the holding place the holding tank of your mind for a few days or even weeks before you invite it to live in your language forever. That is your role as gatekeeper. With difficulty, any new expression, grammatical construct, or word will come into your language. And once it's already there, with difficulty it will leave. Bring in the unassailable rule that canon items will um, will not be changed or altered frivolously or arbitrarily. Uh, canon items have or gravitas. You would only alter them for a serious reason. Uh, this prevents that the or the language from always good with to the extent that it never stabilizes. This um, allows the language to uh, form around a stable core. Uh, the focus on para'a or ketasha, and uh, the focus on sound ensures 
that the language creator is audibly pleasing. If the language is attractive to the ear of its creator, like a refreshing oasis in the desert, it will call unto them. The creator, the discoverer, therefore will want to learn it. The focus on meaning ensures that the soul, the internal truth of the language, will deepen and be more um, successfully communicated to everyone. Uh, this sounds um, metaphysical. But every language has its own flavor. The we're talking down the flag behind us. <laughs> the, um, the soul of a language comes from its culture and from its um, as a means of self-expression, um, it is necessary that the language have something to say. Every discovered word, every sentence, should be evaluated on the standard of, it, of sound and meaning. That is, that according to the aesthetic pleasure that it gives, and according to the deep and powerful content that it has, is how it should be evaluated. Um, Words and sentences sound and flow in the way that you want. This will strengthen the organic flavor. The learning and living your conlang will strengthen, the, uh, strengthen your fluency in the language. As we Itlani say, this is hitting one target with two arrows. Um, flu the motiv motivation comes primarily from three things. Firstly, speaking from using the language. Secondly, the intrinsic, um, uh, um, the intrinsic or the innate expressiveness uh, ve, uh, and capability uh, and uh, ability of communicating your ideas. Whenever possible, use the language. In thought, in writing, in speaking, from your favorite um, books, uh, random paragraphs on various topics should be translated. 
Savashi Dvani Parajana Vos Kankayati. Ah, yes. Zorni it Satishova, Vijeni Sakafarun, Vefidiri Uvakinarun, Ukrintu Yati. Ah, you should keep a um, current notebook of new words and expressions. Oh, and ideas. She aspari saferova ta echarashari so so lilu te biati. Keep a um, daily journal in the growing language. Laiso kasha de dini felenu marbunyari. Even if the entries are only sporadic. Rantiva uni bashi sholese tarunyari. Whenever you translate something into your conlang. I idova talsti veragadanji. Uh, do it thought by thought, not word by word. This will free you from your native language. And help you to think natively in your conlang. Whenever you write some, uh, some short passage in your conlang, um, use, using the, um, the concept realm or the paradigm of uh, uh, think and write using the paradigm of the culture of the speakers of the language. In mind and heart, try to, uh, to move yourself to the place where your language is spoken. Uh, daily in the realm somewhere real of your language, uh, this will remove all excuses for not using your language. Saliavo. I mean, he needs verbs. <laughs> He just said to me, please provide a verb, and I'm like, what's for? Dini ta divayit shodit lai chilan tamulu tarasa'a bavyate. In the surrounding linguistic environment of actual reality, Mornishe vrante shrunyara. Um, act and live only when you need to. Tamagit, tamagishe. Um, otherwise, internally avoid. Let your motto be always in my codling, no excuses. Your codling is a living, breathing organism. Uh, therefore, um, it wants to, if you will allow it. Don't allow yourself, the creator, the discoverer of the conlang, to become an obstacle to the conlang. Your conlang lives within you. And it wants to freely uh, develop. As the, as the creator of the language, uh, the documenter, and the archivist, uh, is you. You are the assigned linguist. Uh, 
who allows your language to penetrate or who enables your language to penetrate into the real world. I call this phenomenon language as found. Allow, your, allow the language to present itself to you intuitively. As though you found it, um, you unexpectedly stumbled upon it on some uh, field expedition in a distant jungle. Um, and then use your skills, whatever they may be, to record the, what you have learned. Uh, this is my non linguist's understanding of conlanging through stability and immersion based on four of my suggestions for conlanging. Taldafar would like to say um, a process of learning the Itlani language and afterwards we will be happy to take Thank you. So, is this one on? No. They're both on? They're both on. Okay, in theory, this one's on. So, um, yes, that was more difficult than I thought it was going to be, <laughs> in case anyone was curious. Um, so, I had thought of actually doing this part uh, in Alursa. In fact, we sort of talked about whether I should do this in Alursa and then realized that there was absolutely nobody who could translate that. And I did think of doing this um, That was supposed to be for you to translate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot we didn't have an Idrani speaking audience. <laughs> um, so, but I, I'm not actually sure, particularly as I'm sort of standing on this side of the cameras and lights and everything, that my Idrani is quite up to saying all of this um, successfully. But it is. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned at the start of this, I had n sort of played with Idrani for some time and was at the point where I could email successfully back and forth had access to a very easy way to look up the words that I needed um, in either direction. So he would send me this, you know, giant email in Idlani and I could read through it and any time I needed a word, which turns out to have been probably at least 50% of the time, I would just look it up. And so you don't actually internalize the words that way. And uh, so I sort of realized that was not going to work translating a talk. Um, and also, vocabulary has always been sort of my with learning languages. I, I can pick up grammar just very um, but in words to actually say something meaningful uh, is, is a whole other part that is much harder for me. So when we first decided this, um, about 12 hours after I submitted the proposal, I had that moment of, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, because it, it just sort of sank in that this was going to be a lot more work than, than I had initially thought. Um, I also quickly recognized that I couldn't just let Jim say anything he wanted to off the cuff while standing up here because, you know, like, probably three quarters of his 14,000 word vocabulary. And I knew that is absolutely impossible for me in three months. Um, I would have given you four. <laughs> so, um, so what I did is I, I um, and I think this is probably a useful place to start when you're learning 
uh, a language is, I tried to pare that down. I made Jim write an essay about what he was going to say. So now I had a set of vocabulary. I could pull all the words he used in that essay out and say, okay, these, I think it worked out to 783 words. Now I can learn these 783 words all about the topic he's going to talk about and say, you can use these, just don't use any others. <laughs> because I may not know them. Um, Myself within a certain uh, vocabulary. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it would have been much cooler, I, I do acknowledge, it would have been much cooler if I could have just had him stand up here and let him just talk on about anything he wanted to say. But it also wasn't practical, you know. If I had another couple of years to prepare for this, maybe we could have done that. If we have time for questions, I will answer your questions in Itlani and you can and translate myself. Ten minutes, okay. Um, so anyway, the first principle was narrow down the... Uh, the, um, the different vocabulary that you're going to plan to work with. So then I went on to an intensive study, um, figured out quickly that having just a printed list of the words wasn't going to do it, um, and I needed to drill myself. I have become uh, an absolute fan of the process of, um, what's it called, spaced repetition, um, which is something that programs like Anki and others use. Um, I have fallen in love with Anki. Um, because I have used it daily for the last three months, uh, sort of drilling myself uh, on Itlani vocabulary. Um, and I had sort of kicked it up, I, I said 40 new words a day. And I did actually make it through <laughs> all of those. Um, the other thing that we did is Jim and I did two in-person meetings and then we set up Skype. I actually recorded him reading through his essay and then I would just play that every day and try to make sure I was catching every word that he said. Um, we did three recordings, I think they all varied. <laughs> so, um, and there were some where, you know, as he would read along, he would skip a paragraph and others where he would sort of say things differently than they were written, so I couldn't rely on the printed material. That was always a little fun. Um, but, uh, so the second principle, that I learned was spaced repetition. If you've got another favorite system that works, then uh, by all means go for it. I will say that the other thing that I use not recognition, so which was a little counterintuitive, but I actually studied the words by having the English come up and my remembering the Itlani. Because what I read, and it is true after three months of doing this, um, if you learn you get recognition in the process, but if you only learn recognition, now you can't necessarily think up the word when you go to use it. So, so recall is doing it English or your native language to the other is going to give you kind of both. Um, and then, uh, so basically, essentially, I've filled three months with Itlani, uh, okay. which has been a little... Sonia. Uh, Thank you. Which has been a little interesting um, because it has sort of pushed my own alorsa to the side, which was a little intimidating when I heard that um, Britain would like to actually interview me in alorsa. Oh my gosh, now I've got to remember my own. <laughs> but uh, the other thing that I did is I, I spent a lot of time creating sentences. As I was, you know, walking around the house or in the shower in the morning or, you know, driving to work or whatever, I would just try to Come to say anything I could think of in Itlani to just kind of practice. So third and final principle would be basically use it, study it, practice it every day. Do not give in to the temptation to let it slide. Um, that was really hard for me. I tend to be a procrastinator. Um, but I had a deadline and an embarrassment factor if I failed, um, which is an, a strong motivator. Um, so, in hopes of making this a little relevant um, for all of you who I'm sure are not planning to learn, you know, probably not planning to learn Itlani to fluency anytime soon, um, how can this information help you become fluent in your own conlang or if you do happen to want to learn someone else's? Uh, learning a well developed, fleshed out, and stable conlang, whether it's your. If you look at those who've learned languages like Ojibwe, um, Abenaki, or other things, 
um, they, don't, they also don't have a lot of available teaching materials. And so they're kind of making it up. There's a great documentary um, on the sort of revitalization of the Ojibwe language that I watched. It was, it, it was kind of a relief because they were having to do the same things I was in trying to learn whether it was Alorsa or Itlani. Um, same deal. And they, so you can learn any good, stable, well-developed conlang that way. Um, so d I would definitely encourage you, I would encourage anybody, um, push yourself. If your conlang isn't stable, apply what Jim has just mentioned, get it stabilized around a solid core that, that you connect with internally, and then invest yourself with it. There is a real sense of accomplishment when you realize you have reached even basic fluency in your own conlang. Um, and uh, at the risk of giving myself another, oh my god, what have I done? Um, at, at Jim's urging, I'm, I would also like to make the offer that if anyone would like to do for our next LCC what Jim and I just did for this one, um, I at least would be happy to help them learn the Alursa language and then I can do a presentation on Alursa and they can in turn translate for me. So. Thank you. And now we'll, we'll take the question. Oh, and uh, before we take the questions, um, do you want to say a little bit about your um, book? And my book came out, uh, Circle of the Lantern, about two months ago. And there is a video trail, and I'm going to share that now. And, and just to and be clear, journey. the book actually has substantial passages in Itlani and takes place. And a complete Iplani. grammar in the appendix. Into a tale of high adventure on a planet struggling to find a serious wizard queen on a common quest to forever change the face and the heart of their world. The convergence of prophecies has dawned and long hidden powers will rise, holding the key to what will show. A world will die, but can a planet be reborn? A fledgling boy and a northern queen hold the answer. This comes a tale of war, peace, magic, and a world in turmoil. about two minutes for two or three minutes for questions so if yeah, there are so um, if you have any question please um, anyone yeah um, please state your name and okay. your question uh, Chris Mosley and my question is uh, uh, Tony you mentioned um, looking up a word when you weren't sure of it what does what exactly was the process of looking up a word in Italy uh, so, I have a, um, well, I have Jim's entire dictionary, and I have, uh, being a computer geek, uh, I basically created myself a text file dictionary, and I have a little script. I, I use Linux on my desktop, so I just created myself a little script where I can just give like a two-letter command, and whatever word I want to look up, and it will just tell me everything that matches that. And the same works if I'm looking it up in English. One more question from the audience, maybe. Yeah. Uh, John Kihara, and uh, my question is for both of you. Um, it, in my experience, uh, you're reading all the very, not anywhere as interested in other people's con legs as they are in their own. So it always fascinates me to see someone who has as much of an interest in someone else's Conlang as they have in their own. What motivated you two to learn each other's conlangs? Was it just the desire to be, since you're both fluent in your own conlangs, was it the was it the desire to share that fluency with someone else, or was it what what dynamics operated that makes you guys different than the majority of conlangers in terms of that drive for flu for fluency in one's own conlang and the ability to converse in someone? Well, I think um, for me, the motivation to learn 
uh, Itlani um, truly just came from friendship. Um, Jim and I are, are very good friends and sort of are, are kind of like brothers born to different parents. Um, and uh, our wives actually have a tendency to, um, to comment on that every once in a while about how similar we are in attitudes and everything that we could easily have been born as brothers. Um, and so, um, you know, as our friendship has deepened, we just, um, with, the, with the love that we had for our own language and for others, I mean, I do study Nat Langs as well, it just seemed only natural that, well, of course I would want to learn enough Idlani because I knew that would be, Jim would really love that and it would be a lot of fun for us to be able to do. Um, I think on your side. Monisha Rubia Vimyaru o Zoeit Gadana Voi Guayave. I just want to use my words. But Tamarfanut is the, friendship is the most important thing. Tamarfanut. Friendship can be the biggest motivator in any field. And and in the field of conlangs, that's also especially true. This question comes from IRC user 55, and this one's for Tony. What was the hardest part of learning Itlani? I, I think just learning the, um, learning vocabulary is very, very difficult for me, for whatever reason, I think it was a mental block. I'm, hope, I'm hoping I'm past it now, and that I can apply this to every other I've been struggling with for all this time. Um, the pronunciation. The, oddly enough, pronunciation was tough for me, which you wouldn't think, given that Alursa is, has this very complex looking phonology. I learned that there, were sev there are several I still cannot pronounce, because they cluster too many consonants together. Um, and then I think the other piece is probably just the, um, the sentence structure is quite a bit different than most of the other languages I know. I, I don't really know a lot of truly verb final languages. And so as we would go to translate, you probably caught the, the Yoda-like translation of those things. Um, it, it's sort of tough because you have to remember about 30 words before you get a verb. And, and I, I just don't have that much room to remember a sentence. Um, I think we're closing in uh, yeah. on the time. I just wanted to say that if 800 years old you were fluent, you would. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much, Jim, for this wonderful display of fluency, and Tony for this really great effort. <laughs> so. Um,
What? Um. <laughs> oh. Sorry about this. We are having technical difficulties with the slides. We will be back shortly. Yeah. Um, the the sound is not the problem. Um, well, the, it was a problem when the the thing crashed, but anyway. Um, okay, you're connected. I see you tweaking it, but you're not getting any data from me. What is up with that? Yeah, but not the slides. I mean, we we could just go with the webcam and figure it out during lunch. Yeah. Oh well. Oh, okay, I can see oh. it. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, you can do that like this. <laughs> okay, with a bit of a delay, um, and I hope, well, technical wide interwebs can, can follow in some shape or form. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present here. Um, I feel quite honored and very excited about this, um, especially because I feel a bit like the odd one out. Um, I do not speak any conlang. I haven't created any conlang yet. So we'll see what happens. Um, what I do, though, is, um, well, I've started recently to do a bit of research into conlangs. Um, I'm a senior lecturer at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, um, here in the UK. And um, my background is in sociolinguistics, second language acquisition, but also a bit in phonetics um, and a bit in phonology. And so I was interested in attitudes towards conlangs and how this might compare with attitudes towards natural languages. And um, this presentation is based on two studies, right? One which I think most of you might have actually taken part in, um, and that was a questionnaire survey I sent around probably a year ago, maybe a bit more than a year ago, where I asked you about your conlangs and the sound system in your conlangs. Um, so I will give you a bit of a summary on that. And um, then the main bulk will be about the actual experiments on language attitudes, um, which was about, well, how people evaluate the different languages um, which I conducted last summer. I'm going to give you an overview of all of this because otherwise it's very, very long. Um, of course, I am more than happy to go into detail with any of these points in the question and answers later, or over lunch, or over tea or coffee, or, or over whatever else it is we're going to do today, right? So just talk to me. I can talk about this for hours. But now I will an online questionnaire. Um, what are your considerations when you create conlang sound systems? And um, I received, I think, about 54 responses or 55 responses, which dealt with, I think, about 105 conlangs. So it was quite, quite, a, you know, quite a bulk of information. On top of this, really, for most of you, was the concern with the ease of pronunciation. Now, ease of pronunciation I found very interesting because, on the one hand, for many of you, it meant ease of pronunciation for yourself. 
you want to be able to produce your own conlang quite comfortably, right? You may not be as fluent in it as, you know, German in, in Itlani, right? But you, you, you know, you want to be able to speak it. On the other hand, some of you did mention that, you know, you would like your conlang to be easy pronounceable on a grander scale, right? So generally easier pronounceable by many people who share either your language or maybe your regional language background or even, you know, a bit more, well, almost universal. Um, and then there were also two responses which I found very interesting, which were, um, well, a bit concerned with the opposite. They wanted their languages to be um, difficult to pronounce for people from a purely English language background. So that was interesting as well. Um, many of you are concerned with aesthetics and beauty, very much about your own concept of what sounds beautiful, what is aesthetically pleasing. Then, not surprisingly, many of you were concerned with realism and naturalism. And in fact, these first three <coughs> points came out on, on very top. They're almost on, on a par. Um, and then some of you were very much interested in certain aspects of linguistic theory. So, you know, perhaps you wanted to um, test certain language changes, certain historical changes throughout languages. Maybe you wanted to test um, how vowel harmony would work in certain environments. Um, then quite a few responses also stated other languages as a source of inspiration. And then finally, sound symbolism. Now, to be honest, this was of course triggered, this last point, because I was explicitly asking you about this. Um, so what role does sound symbolism play? Are you aware of this? And of course, most of you were, most of you made, made it part of your language. However, on a scale that corresponds with realism, right? So because sound symbolism is something that you found or that we find in natural languages, of course, you also had a lot of exceptions to the rule. The reason why I thought this was interesting was, well, this, not this character, but this kind of idea behind it. Now, um, I did this experiment, well, test thing, um, at Longcon as well, where I conducted um, the main bulk of data on attitudes. And uh, I realized the results here will be different because you are a very special audience indeed, but you know, may maybe there's some kind of overlap. If you were to name this fictional character and you had a choice of names, you were not allowed to make up your own name, sorry, but you had a choice of these, who of you would think this looks like somebody you might want to call Atlan. Can you raise your hand if you think so? Yeah, one, two, three, four, okay. What about Ilaya? Ilaya, one, two, three. Erosan, one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, seven, not bad. Rulgalgrop, one, two, three. Yeah, that's a bit more, who, who would vote for Gox? <laughs> the, the great majority. <laughs> And this, this, is, this is kind of similar to um, what was happening at, at Longcon, and in fact what happened in Elzen's study when, when she got conducted this um, on a bigger scale, of course. Um, <coughs> sorry about the background noise. Um, so we, we seem to have, uh, whether we are in linguistics or not, we seem to have a feel for what kind of sound patterns work with what kind of um, attributes. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this table. There is some kind um, in, in, you know, what kind of, what, what kind of relationship we assign or we see between sounds and, uh, and meaning. And you see here, the typical example is, is usually small versus 
large, where we, we have across a number of languages sounds like e and e, which denote small or small things, and we tend to have more, well, what are perceived as bigger sounds, u and o and a, um, for, for words that are large. But of course, there are exceptions, like the English word big, which has an i in it, and is supposedly a large word, right? So, but um, interestingly, this is something we find a bit in conlangs as well. And of course, this will be very much your intention when you're constructing the language. That's what you might want to bring in there, right? That's your approach to, to sound symbolism. Whereas languages such as celestial um, do not quite follow this because they're purely philosophical. So there is a very different sound meaning relationship. <clears throat> We'll come to these languages in a bit more detail in, in a moment when, when I talk about the second um, experiment I ran, the one on attitudes towards languages in, you know, in general. Now, when we look at the public debate on languages, this idea of how languages sound and whether they sound aesthetically pleasing yeah, or beautiful, seems to play a major role for many people. Um, so I did a very quick Twitter survey throughout the month of March just to see what kind of languages were associated or were called an ugly language, followed by Dutch, then French and Chinese and Arabic and Danish, and then the, you know, the list went on. Beautiful languages, on the other hand, were Italian, Spanish, French as well, interestingly, um, Chinese and Japanese and so on. So French seems to be a bit of everything. And um, when we look at the context in which this was embedded, then um, ugly language was very much, the, these were most of the time tweets of people complaining that they had to learn these languages and they clearly didn't want to learn them for whatever reason. Whereas beautiful languages, were usually embedded in some kind of discourse on visiting the place, having nice holiday memories, and so on and so forth, right? So it's this cultural background, the wider social knowledge that made these people evaluate languages. And that's, well, that, that holds across the board, so it's the, the cultural context that, that informs such evaluations. I know that because I was born in such a place. <laughs> um, but um, so I was wondering how does it work with conlangs where people hear a language that they have no associations with or languages that they might have other types of associations with. You know, let's say people hear Klingon. I'm sure they've never been in an environment where people naturally speak Klingon. Um, I, I would assume, but... You never know. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> that would be another experiment. Um, so, you know, um, I, I was interested in this. So that was the starting point for um, the second experiment. In addition to that, um, of course, from the academic literature, we know that there are other factors that, that contribute to or the first languages of the listeners, right? Which contributes to our own cultural context, of course. Um, the number of second languages that we know, that we're familiar with, and then the level of familiarity with the language itself that we're listening to. Um, so what I did was run the experiments with um, 109 participants, of which I used 100 data sets, because some of them were, were invalid um, so I couldn't use them. We used 24 languages. I'll show you the language list in a moment. These languages were, you know, people listened to them um, to a stretch of, of language for about 30 seconds. Then they rated these on a seven-point scale from, you know, one to seven on the following traits. So they rated whether the language sounds pleasant or not pleasant or 
very friendly or not friendly, right? Always on the scale. They rated whether this language sounds educated, peaceful or aggressive, or strange, and natural or artificial, okay? There was an optional section where they could write the name of the language or the region if they think they noticed that. But this was optional at, at that stage. And these were the languages. So natural languages, you see some which, you know, we would assume people are very familiar with, like English, French, Mandarin, Chinese, or Spanish. Others people may be familiar with, like Finnish or Hindi or Russian, but then others which you know, people are less likely to have come across before, like Sherpa, like Inupiatum, for example. And then constructed languages. Um, I should say a very big thank you to everyone who took the time to contribute a recording of their language. I know for some of you it took quite some effort and time to, to get that done wi without your contribution. Um, and again, in these constructed languages, there are some which I thought people would, would know and, and recognize, like Klingon and Dothraki, of course, and Esperanto, but then others which really people are, you know, would have not been very likely to come across before, like Moton, like um, Celestial, and so on. So that, that was the basis, and data was collected in a session Long Con 3, last year's World Science Fiction Convention, a very diverse audience, um, and um, these are the results. And I don't expect you to actually rec see anything there, but bear with me a second. I'll, I'll show you this for a reason. You see that some languages were evaluated somewhere in this lower part of the scale, predominantly, whereas others are shooting right up there on their traits, right? So we've this for each language, and then the different colors are the different traits. We'll zoom into the conlangs in a moment. I'll just want to show you here the difference between languages that people know, like English, French, and Mandarin, which were evaluated all kind of around three or underneath the value of three. So the lower the value, the more favorable the judgment, right? So over, across the board, these were rated very, very, very positively. Whereas this one was across the board rated extremely negatively. You won't be surprised to hear that this is Klingon. <laughs> And of course, this was part of the, of the design of the language, right? It was not designed to sound particularly friendly or peaceful. Um, we know that. Um, and again, which was rated very positively, and that is Spanish, right? So again, a, a rather well-known language. What is interesting, though, are these two languages, which were rated rather positively, only have rather negative ratings on the level of familiarity, and these are two conlangs. This is Celestial and Vajo. And that's the moment where I zoom into the conlangs. And again, sorry, I can't, sit, I can't stand still for very long. Again, you, you see these are now in alphabetical order with um, Castithan here. Celestial, I do apologize in advance if I um, mispronounce any of your languages. You can beat me up for that later, but we'll just have to live with it for the moment. So, Castithan, Celestial, this is Dothraki, Egeldish, Esperanto, Itlani, Klingon, Moton, and Vajo. And you see that this sort of turquoise bar is relatively high up for most of them, which means a low level of familiarity. But then many of the other traits, especially this green one here, which stands for educated, isn't that bad at all for many of them. And um, 
and again, you know, cling on. Um, so I'm just going to tease apart some of, some of the findings, which also places these conlangs um, and the findings a bit more in, in, um, you know, in context with, with natural languages. So, The further down on the scale, uh, the, the, the shorter the bar, or the, the better, you could say, the more favorably it's been rated, yeah. Um, so I just tease it apart a bit like, like this. So I looked at, you know, the five most familiar sounds across the board, and unsurprisingly, we've got English, French, Spanish, Mandarin, Chinese there. Interestingly, also Esperanto. That is because very few people actually recognized Esperanto as Esperanto. <laughs> and uh, I was delighted to see that for many people it sounded like Spanish or Portuguese or Polish or Italian or Romanian <laughs> or... There was something else, I forgot. Oh yeah, Czech. So, it's, it, you know, and, and you, you know the story of Esperanto, you know it's, you know, influenced by, by so many um, European languages, so maybe that's, that's not a surprise. Um, the least familiar sounding languages were only one conlang, Dothraki, other than that, Hawaiian, Inupiatun, Xhosa, and Sherpa. I was very surprised because I was expecting people to actually know Dothraki, especially when you heard the reading from, you know, it's, it's, it even had Dothraki in it twice. <laughs> it even said Dothraki, with a slightly different inflection, granted. But, okay, so people didn't get that. Maybe the audience wasn't geeky enough. Maybe they weren't doing their homework. But in, in any case, um, these were the least familiar sounding languages. So if we put that in relation to other traits, great pattern, okay? So Hawaiian, Inupiatun were the least educated sounding languages, but then there were other languages in the mix as well. So it's not a very, to be the least pleasant, the least friendly, the least peaceful, and the least natural. So it w was among the least, the, the bottom five of, of these traits. Interestingly, now, before you all turn and look at the creator, let me explain something here. Very few people actually identified it as Dothraki. Many people thought it was Arabic. And that's the moment where I thought it's really a shame that I left the guess the region and origin of the speaker optional because I think that would have been very interesting additional data to have. So that's something to consider for my future studies. Um, we never stop learning, I guess. Um, if we look at familiarity in relation to other traits, again, with the most familiar languages, of course, there we have a you know, much stronger um, with you know, pleasant, natural, natural um, educated, friendly, peaceful, and so on there seems to be a lot more going on. And, and it looks like, you know, when we're familiar with the language, we're more likely to, you know, rate it favorably across the board. Other traits were naturalness. How does, you know, is it, does it sound natural? Does the language sound natural? And interestingly, we've got five conlangs in the bottom five. So were people good at spotting the conlangs? I'm not convinced. Um, yes, of course, Klingon, that certainly, you know, that, that was part of the, of the design. Um, but for languages, well, it could have been that really it was the language, but I guess there, it's, it's very likely that there were other factors that influenced these ratings and these evaluations. For example, the recordings as such, other factors. Um, still, I think 
that I need to look into in a bit more detail, okay? Um, because even though the recordings for most, for, for you know, all of these conlangs were readings, you know, people were reading something, this still applied to a lot of the natural language um, samples, of course. These were also people reading something. So how, how does that work out, right? What, what were people picking up there? And this is, again, something I would like to look at in, in a bit more detail. Um, the other things I was particularly interested in um, was also, of course, the, the background of the listeners. How much does that have an influence? And um, so I looked at you know, the first language. And um, you see, I, because of the way the study was run, you know, in a session at Longcorn, I couldn't kind of regulate the, the people sitting there, right? I had to take whichever data they were giving me. And so um, the, the categories are very unbalanced. For, well, for, for the first language, um, there were three categories. One is um, people who had English as their first language and no other language, um, and these were 68. Then English and another language, so they were bilingual or multilingual, um, and these were only six, sadly. And then it, people who had another language but not English as their first language, and these were 26. And there were only very few significant differences between these groups, which were not in, in a pattern or anything. So there is no specific pattern for this, which may well be due to the, um, the um, uneven um, population groups or sample groups. Um, and these fell roughly into four categories. Um, for second language, when, when I asked people, well, you know, what, what other languages are you familiar with? I was interested purely in the level of familiarity. So have they heard the language before? So it's not very um, kind of spe specific, the information I got there. But um, still, there were four people who knew no second languages, only English. Oh. We'll deal with that later. Um, then there were 38 people who had one between one and three um, second languages, 52 who knew four to nine second languages, and indeed six who listed more than te or 10 or more languages that they had some familiarity with. And there, there was actually a trend in the data, um, a, a general tendency. So it looks like the more second languages you know, second languages you're familiar with, the more favorable you um, are going to rate the languages, you know, the more friendly you are towards other languages, if you like. And here, for, for the second language knowledge, it didn't matter whether these were natural languages or constructed languages, any language counted. Um, so that's good news. Um, maybe we should all learn more languages. We could all start with Itlani tomorrow. <laughs> today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Odothraki, that might actually boost the, the ratings. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, now, um, just to close with some general problems. Now, um, I mentioned that, um, and these are things I need to consider when I, um, when I, uh, well, construct my, my next experiments. Um, first of all, the groups were unbalanced, so I have to obviously account for that. May have been a factor, so that's something I'm going to address in, in the next round. Of course, I'm not going to make the information on the assumed origin of the speaker optional again, because that is too interesting to know. Um, and because of the way this experiment was set up, people heard each language only once by one speaker. And that's a bit of an issue. I mean, everyone who knows a bit about sociolinguistics will see that these are serious concerns. Um, but bear in mind that this was a very first kind of study just to look into what's possible in this area and what's going on. And I think 
the results we have here are actually quite useful in continuing this. You know, they, they give us a way towards, towards which we can progress um, with regard to, well, studying things um, in a bit more detail. So, I said I'm not going to talk very long. In fact, I'm more interested in a lot of time for questions. Um, so, thank you very much. And, um, yeah, give me your questions. <laughs> <clears throat> So, really interesting. Uh, any questions? Yeah, get, uh, give your name and the question. Uh, Martin Keegan. Um, were you aware of any uh, sort of correlations between those five or six traits that I mentioned, educated versus, educated versus pleasant and, uh, and aggression and so on? And did you know anything about what, uh, or whether or not people's knowledge of specific languages influenced their um, attitude towards related languages. Like if you speak English or German, you think of Dutch and Danish as sounding like complete gibberish, even though they're quite similar, but interfered and were, there, um, were the trays interfering with each other? Um, well, in, in terms of you know, people's language knowledge influencing um, ratings on specific um, languages, there was no relation. Um, that might have been the case also because people were, well, the whole thing was conducted in English. It was in predominantly English-speaking environment, so I, I assume there must have been some influence from, from that side. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the, the question about the correlation between traits. Is, is it possible that a perception of educatedness and a perception of pleasantness might really be measuring the same thing or that these two things are, are correlated with each other. How do you know that those traits are independent variables? Um, there was no clear correlation between the, the traits as such, um, but this is something I need to look in, into in a bit more detail. But in, in a first kind of general overview, um, that there wasn't anything kind of jumping up. Well, thank you. I have another person here. Thanks. Uh, hello. I was at the and took that survey, and I remember that uh, I thought that um, all the uh, recordings with only one voice speaking were less natural than when there were two people, when there were clearly radio broadcasts. So um, for if you're doing sounds again, I, I think you should try to have, well, to people talking, if that's possible. If uh, Tony and, um, and Jim had been sp speaking Itlani together, I think Itlani would have had a much better uh, naturalness score, for instance. Yeah, that's a very good point. In fact, the reason why there were, so in, in the results we had people reading something, and then another set of samples where people were talking in whatever shape or form, so you heard more than one speaker, had to live with at that time because we were looking at so many different languages that for some languages we just had to grab whatever sample we could get because we couldn't get hold of speakers of that language. And in order to mix it up, you know, we, we used um, such samples across the board. But of course, yes, that's, that's a very important consideration. Ideally, what we should be doing is have people speak the same language and then mix that up because um, you know, it's very difficult to have one person. Ideally, we would have one person speaking all the different languages, but <laughs> that's a bit difficult. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, in, in this case, you know, that's, that's how we had to deal with in this particular experiment. Okay. Someone from IRC? Uh, 55 from IRC asks, has the same study been conducted somewhere else, and if so, was the outcome any different? Not yet, but I really want to run it somewhere else. Um, I'm especially interested in running this in other first language environments, um, because I think that might give us very different results. Um, because as I said, you know, we had here the, the English context. Um, let's see how, what it looks like in, in a different setting.
where people might actually be able to tell Arabic from Dothraki, for example. That would help, I think. I'm, I'm curious about that, since it was confused with Arabic. Um, was the Dothraki sample uh, just David uh, talking, or was it from the Game of Thrones show? No, it was actually David reading okay. uh, a you know, piece of text. Another question? Yeah. Um, I was curious about the sound samples that you used um, because uh, kind of continuing the conversation we had earlier, if you use two people talking, it's going to sound more natural. But for any kind of text, if you have them, it's not going to sound as pleasant as two people maybe giving love letters to each other. So I wanted to know if there was standardization across different language samples in that respect. So um, well, the, the topic that we, people were talking about was usually either conversational or something a bit more neutral. It was not people arguing. Um, and uh, in, in fact, you said conversations sound more natural. It didn't for Klingon. That was a conversation, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree. Of course, that of the things we, we need to address, and it go, goes back to, to the point you made, right? OK. Um, we have two questions, and I think they're slightly similar, so I'm going to ask them both. Um, were, were there any studies that influenced you to conduct this study? And then uh, that was from uh, Man of Zalego, and then from Shi Sanya. Uh, what got you interested in studying conlangs in particular? Um, so to answer the first question, what got me interested in this particular study was, well, I did research on attitudes towards accents and dialects in particular before. Right, I did that for my PhD and, and continued that after that. Um, but um, yes, then I realized that in, in much of my research, especially on accents and dialects, what people were evaluating were not only you know, their, their regional accent or the perceived you know, regional background or the perceived first language background, but it was also actually the fact whether or not they were successful learners of the language. And I thought, well, let's tease that apart. Let's see what people do just with the language. Um, in addition to factors such as familiarity, which, you know, to my knowledge, haven't been uh, researched that well yet. Um, and what got me interested in doing research into conlangs was mostly because, well, I've been interested in conlangs for a very long time as an observer, of course, so far. But um, um, I, I jumped at the opportunity to be able to include conlangs in, in this particular. OK, this is another question from IRC from Pogo Stick. Um, <laughs> and I think I'll try to elaborate, because I think I, under, I understand the question. So uh, he, uh, Pogo Stick man asks, was there any between language typology and its natural naturalness rating? So like. For example, maybe a, a certain word order types correlated as more highly natural or less natural, maybe. Um, I haven't looked into that in much detail, but I believe we have quite a few language creators here. Do you think that your languages are typologically very similar? <laughs> I know it's a tough <laughs> but No, OK. So. On the extreme scale, probably not. But of course, I can't say you know, whether that's the case in, in detail, because I haven't looked into this. Um, but it's a very good question. Thank you. I, I just As a quick follow-up, do you have a slide for the most natural ones? Yes. Uh, again, because uh, it might be that that's where the correlation comes in. I, just, I don't have one in that. Oh, I don't have the most natural ones. Actually, I took that out. No, that's familiar. Oh, yeah, here. OK. So there they're in. They're secondarily in. Um, but these were, again, the languages people were familiar with, right? So there's a correlation possibly between that um, at, at some level. Uh, regarding the um, level of naturalness uh, versus artificial sounding um, parameter, I'm curious about uh, the readings you had, the recordings you had of conlangs. Uh, in my experience, 
I've noticed that many conlangers, especially those with English as, a, as their L1, not all, but many conlangers tend to pronounce their own conlang with an English accent. <laughs> um, even though they may not realize they're doing so, hmm. uh, they tend to glide their long vowels into, you know, yod and wow kind of um, uh, glides and things like that, uh, uh, velarized L's, stuff like that. Uh, do you think that had, uh, since I never heard these recordings, did the, did the person's recordings, do you think that swayed the degree of naturalness due to their own because they hadn't practiced or what factors such as that? Um, good question. Thank you. Personally, I do not think that was the case. Um, mostly because, well, the, the recordings were of a very, very high quality. Um, and I know for a fact that many of these 30 to 40 second recordings took five hours to make because people were stumbling and then they you know, had to, had to start all over again. Um, but in the end, what, what they sent me were, you know, just very, very fluent, and they sounded fluent. There was not a trace of, of English kind of accentedness in, in there at all. Do um, you want to share your experience of recording it? Yeah, I just, I did the modern recording, naturally. <laughs> Uh, basically, that was my uh, very first uh, translation, The North Wind and the Turn, which is quite short, so it fit uh, quite well. But uh, indeed, it took me, well, um, something like an hour to just set up everything so that I could actually speak it, plus, plus all the n notes about the, the intonation that I would have to use to be as fluent as possible. And then it took me, yeah, about something like five hours to finally have a 30-second recording that was good enough. <laughs> Moten is not the easiest <laughs> language to pronounce. So, and even afterwards, I, after the recording, I did some post-production on it. I uh, eliminated noise, I kind of uh, awkward pauses moved. Everything was smoothened so that it ended up really sounding uh, as natural and fluent as I thought it should be. So I don't know if the other recordings were, uh, common recordings were done like that, but basically that's what I did to get my recording. All right, um, one more question from uh, Man of Zalego on IRC. Uh, he was wondering, or they were wondering if uh, this study has been published anywhere in a paper. Not yet, um, but I, I am working on it. I've, I've um, submitted a script to a journal, which I hope, you know, might come out um, next year, probably. It does. Um, and of course, I, I will share um, the link to the paper, or the paper, um, probably better, as, as soon as I know about that. Um, but with follow-up studies, of course, I'm, I'm hoping to publish even more on this, and to, you know, just Hi, Christian Talman. Um, I was wondering, Klingon is designed to be as weird as possible. Um, for the other conlangs, were there any design goals specifically along one of these axes? Like, were they supposed to be particularly mellifluous or weird or, I don't know, aggressive? And did they actually meet those goals? Um, well, from, from the information I, I have, um, I know that um, Celestial and certainly also Vaya were supposed to sound um, quite pleasant, right? Um, in that way, they, they do meet the design goals. None of these, as far as I know, was supposed to sound extremely aggressive, other than Klingon. Um, Dothraki. Dothraki is supposed to be. <laughs> um, but yeah, for Itlani, do you think that it's a fair representation, or did did people get it wrong? Just drag you into this. But <laughs> no, I think it is. I think it is fair. 
I have one yeah. comment to make about the uh, the English sounding. Mm -hmm. I often wonder about that. I'm a native English speaker, American. Um, I don't want to insult any of the real English speakers here. I, <laughs> I speak American. I speak American, and uh, you know, um, in in the language, I think for all of us, the language coming out, um, we're liable not reproduce sounds that we neither perceive nor commonly use. We may, through extreme practice, do that. Mm. But we know that um, and Tony cannot make them. Tony can, so, I mean, he's a native English speaker too. So I don't know, but it is a concern, I think, that way. But I think they got it. Yeah. Uh, Itlani is sort of uh, neutral on the aggressive, pleasant side, yeah. because like all languages, it's used for just about anything. So the neutral point would be at four here. And you see Itlani is above four for above four for familiarity. Not surprisingly, people didn't know it that well. Um, and it's right in the middle for pleasant and friendly. It's actually doing quite well for, for educated and indeed natural. So living your language, living your conlang seems to, seems to work out, right? <clears throat> Any more question? No? So um, thank you very much for this very interesting study and I am looking forward for the follow-up. <laughs> uh, stop in a minute. Um, the lunch will be ready in the same place that we had uh, uh, drinks uh, in a few minutes in, pro in principle. It should be there at one o'clock. We will start again at two o'clock sharp. So please be back um, before that, at least 10 minutes before that, if possible. Um, I don't have any special um, uh, comment or announcements to make for, uh, for now. So you do? Uh, we're having some uh, internet bandwidth issues, so uh, please don't use a lot of bandwidth. IRC, e email, etc. is fine, but please don't play a YouTube video or something because we're trying to upload to YouTube, uh, and yeah, we want all the pipes. <laughs> Thanks. So, 50 minutes or something, lunch will be ready. Also, anyone on YouTube who's watching this, you need to switch to day one, part two, uh, which should be at youtube.com slash fiatlingua, either now or very shortly.